knows about one very famous consultation that the Prophet conducted. Think about it for a minute. Let's see. It pertains to his wife. Um Salama. Um Salama, right? Um Salama. What's the story of Um Salama and the, and the consultation with Um Salama? Tell me. Oh, that's a different story, but let's give that story. Uh, some of the women, uh, well, there are two complaints women made. One of them is that the Quran uh, linguistically was addressing the um, male, you know, masculine uh, figure all the time. And they said, well, where are we in this, in this language? So the Quran started after that being revealed both in masculine and feminine uh, genders. So it would say al-mu'minun wal-mu'minat, al-muslimun wal-muslimat. Everything was uh, uh, revealed that way. So it was very cons responsive to the concerns of the community. By the way, you will find this a lot in the Quran, that the women would come to the Prophet, raise a question with him, and the Quran is revealed to respond to, to these issues. For example, one woman came and asked, God, uh, if, uh, asked the Prophet for uh, a very important question uh, concerning married life. And she did not get the answer from the Prophet she wanted. So she pursued it some more. And she insisted and persisted and became a hassle. <laughs> she wouldn't go away. So she was called the argumentative one, Al Mujadila. And what happened? A whole chapter in the Quran was revealed for the woman who argued. It's called the woman who argued, answering her. Because she told the Prophet, she said, I'm not asking you. I'm asking your God. Go back to your God and get me the answer. Huh? She was very brave. Compare, compare yourself to her. She was arguing with the Prophet himself. But remember, the Prophet was uh, uh, you know, modest. He practiced humility. He encouraged people around him to talk. He did not oppress them. He did not suppress them. So a woman could come to him and say, I'm not asking you. I don't like your answer. Go to your God and get me the right answer. That's what happened. And he went back, and the whole chapter, the woman who argued, you can look it up in the Quran, was revealed. Who, who is this woman? The woman who argued. <laughs> That's all I know about it. What's the name of the story? Al Mujadila. Some people say it says Al Mujadila. So, hi, come on in. This is Dean Karaman, and she'll be addressing me. So, the question that I was, uh, the, uh, the, the example I was raising of Um Salama is a little bit different. What happened between the Prophet and his wife, Um Salama? All right, I'll go to you this time. Okay. Um, so um, it was when they were doing uh, Umrah, uh, they, they were heading off to Mecca to do the Umrah, and then the Prophet made uh, the Asuh al So it was... Um, uh, so he had engaged in a political reconciliation yeah. with his enemies, <coughs> and the Muslims, the new Muslims, could not understand why the Prophet, when he is so strong, was engaging in a reconciliation and an, uh, and an agreement instead of just going in and, and uh, you know, overcoming all his enemies. So they got moody. Uh, you know, they pouted. Uh, and what happened? What and else? So the Prophet was asking them to uh, cut off their, their hair. And uh, that's a sign of that they are not doing the Umrah this year. They're going to come back the next year. And um, because they weren't convinced, they didn't want to do that. Yeah, they were very unhappy. They were starting to uh, engage in mutiny, right? Exactly. And I, I, I actually can't imagine in Abu Bakr, for example, doing that. But all, all of the companions were not doing that. 
doing that. He refused to obey the prophet. So we can say, so yeah, he went to Usama and he said, um, well, let's say a little bit about him, that he was despondent, he was sad that this happened. And he was thinking, you know, what am I going to do? Everybody who followed me is saying, you shouldn't have done it, and they're refusing now to obey me and do what needs to be done to come next year. That is, they didn't want the sort of the, the peace agreement that he made. All right, so now he went home and he was unhappy. What happened? And then he told Um Salama that, um, I think he was telling her that Halakha to Muhammad, that so the companions are all disobeying me now, and that's a big issue, this is the prophet. And he's the leader. He's the leader. And uh, then she said, well, why don't you go out and you cut your hair? And then everyone would do the same. So um, in a way, she saved all the companions from well, this. Let's, let's, before we jump to the conclusion, he went to Um Salama, a woman in his house with his wife, asking for advice, for shura, for consultation. He didn't go to Abu Bakr or Amar and so on. He went to this woman. And he said, what do you think I should do? And, well, she didn't say, listen, this is a man's thing. This is too serious. I can't give you my opinion. What if I'm wrong? You hold me responsible. You know all these answers? No, she said, oh, I'll tell you. Just go and do what you ask them to do. Do it in front of them. They will fall. And the prophet could have said, this is just too simplistic. You don't understand how deep this problem is. This is like really, you know, men are upset. And you women think that if I go out and cut my hair, they'll do the same. No. He said, OK. And what did he do? And they, he went out and he asked one of the companions to cut his hair. And I find it funny here because they were, a moment before, they were disobeying what the prophet Muhammad was asking them to do. And when he cut his hair, there was not even one hair that fell on the floor. They were um, competing to take the hair, and then everyone else did the same. So, so she saved the Torah. Oh, she she said said everybody who commented on that instance is that she saved the Ummah from real division. It was a very important consultation that Um Salama gave to the Prophet. So women are part of the political process, not only in voting, in making the views uh, known as to who they would like to be the head of state or in the system, but they also participate in providing practical advice about how to run the state, certain political issues, right? Such as the political problem that the prophet faced with his followers. And of course, the queen of Sheba, who was the queen of a, according to the Quran, a very strong people very strong people. She turned, when, when Solomon invited her to, to, to Islam, she turned to her people. And she said, we are a people of strength and power. And I'm turning to you to give me your advice. What would you like me to do? So again, Queen of Sheba, who was spoken of positively in the Quran, also turned to consultation. Consultation is part and parcel of Islamic uh, governance, okay? In modern times, consultation might show itself either in, as some ju uh, jurists have explained, parliamentary uh, work. So the parliament basically represents the shura of the people. But also, if you look at a system like the United States, the president here has many advisors. So advisors could be within the executive branch, which we will talk about. It could be within the legislative branch. And it's even in the Supreme Court and the judicial branch, and so far as they search for you know, uh, uh, articles and, and compendiums on certain positions that have written, uh, been written by scholars, and they look at them, and they can get enlightened by them. So shura could happen in every branch of society, vertically as well as horizontally. So whatever we're talking about today is not new and is not Western. It's part and parcel and deeply part of the roots of Islam.